Good afternoon everybody and most welcome to H744 and I will today speak about an Alexander term called bear awareness and that could be called the state when inhibition makes your system understand what you are doing. Uh, what I'm looking for here is uh, another explanation than the one we brought up earlier by Ken Ware. Why the slow movement sort of uh, adds understanding to the body-mind system. And as you remember, maybe uh, Ken Ware meant that the chaotic system that is body-mind uh, is having too much noise regulates, so it can't read off itself and then we can continue to misuse ourselves, so to speak. Uh, Ken Ware does not use the term misuse. What he says that there is a strange attractor that is not the optimal. A little bit like fibrillation when it comes to the heart. So, but Let's have a look here at Alexander and here goes to show also philosophy come into the game. Uh, I was watching a discussion uh, between the, one of the many discussions I have to say uh, between Ian McGilchrist and some other people. There are like discussions popping up every week now. It's becoming incredibly popular and uh, it was really interesting because they were supposed to speak about spiritu spirituality uh, which is a, uh, an aspect of the right hemisphere that Ian McGilchrist believes in. And during the discussion they went into problems because the two spiritual guys coming from Plum Village, they start talking about a point from nowhere, most literally, uh, actually book of Thomas Nagel. Uh, and a point from nowhere is the typical attitude of the left hemisphere. And of course, uh, Nikhil Christ started to wonder, is that you, what you want to have? Do you want to have a point from nowhere, the objective stance? And uh, I don't think the problem was resolved in that discussion. Uh, in the end, they agreed we're properly into the same area, but we can't agree on this definition. But I think that was stopping it a bit too early. I think there is an actual problem here. Because if you mention something like bare awareness, you start to think a little bit like a point from nowhere, that there is no perspective that you don't take an attitude and I agree completely uh, with the exposure that Thomas Nagel has about this ideology or tendency of a point from nowhere uh, because it's so prevalent in analytical philosophy and society of today so also I run into trouble when it comes to bare awareness and uh, I've been thinking about that and actually in this case the Klein bottle came to my aid because what is the clearest awareness in the Klein bottle? That is actually anything from a point from nowhere. It's a definite point. Actually what it is in the Klein bottle, what space itself does it's absolute subjectivity. That is the clearest form of awareness in the Klein bottle. And that's also the case in quantum mechanics. Why is that? Well, it's because our observation actually, actually make the superposition to collapse. So that's pretty definite. It doesn't get any more definite than that. So let's try to see this. Do not uh, associate bare awareness of some sort of objectivity in the olden sense, in the sense of the analytical philosophers 
or in modern age, a true sant, but see it as an absolute subjectivity. When you system, when me being who I am or working to the best, I'm bound to be as subjective as possibly could. I see everything exactly from my own point of view and nobody else. And when you start to think about it, it makes sense. And it's actually congruence with Thomas Nagel because in this case, I can say I have an experience and it's true because I take everything that is me into the experience. So I think this problem actually could be resolved. And now I actually have something to say to you, McKilchrist, because in this discussion it didn't get resolved. Uh, I would try to put a link uh, with this discussion uh, in the bottom of the video so you can have a look see for yourself but uh, uh, in the end it didn't get resolved and they agreed not to speak about the subject anymore but I, I think it needs to be resolved and once you understand that it's easier to understand what Alexander meant because when he wrote this bare awareness that was in 1923 that's almost a hundred years ago and you can be pretty sure that Alexander more or less was not affected by analytical philosophy. Yes, he was coming up then and it was a change in all educational system in all areas. But remember, he grew up somewhere completely different in Tasmania and he was mostly self-educated. He was a person who did not receive much from the outside world because he did it himself. He was, as they say in Australian jargon, a self-made man. So this is how it sounds from the, the very massive book, Constructive Conscious Control. I don't know who came up with that name. Uh, maybe it was selling in 1923, it's not today, I can tell you. But he writes that conscious guidance and control in the use of the self is necessary for mankind to adapt successfully to his changing environment. It is primarily a plane to be reached. And here we see a very clear uh, congruence here with slowing down and what Ken Ware is saying. This is the more harmonious state. It's a balanced state. And then your perception is being more acute, specific, correct. And we're not ending up in this hellhole. <laughs> we're instead going to ourselves as an absolute point of departure. And with that understanding, and I read uh, something from Constructive Conscious Control, it starts to make sense to me. Once I get more balance, both in my mental aspects, slowing down of the thinking process, make uh, the thinking processes not end up in their old ways, because we have habits both when it comes to thinking and movement. It is the same thing. And uh, if I move wrongly, so to speak, or do misuse, wrongly often gets this association. But when I mean wrongly, I mean bad for me as who I am, not from the perspective of somebody else not from an outside perspective. It's about how I work or what I want to be. And that's actually very important to point out. Otherwise, you will end up trying to be something you don't want to be. And that makes a huge difference. That 
actually flies in the eyes of what Alexander wanted to convey to us. He wanted us to be individuals as we are, not like a standard. And once reading his book, it becomes more and more obvious. He was criticizing a point from nowhere, and that could be this correct posture that was very prevalent in those days, the military posture. When you put your chest out and you drag your buttocks in and you're standing straight in a really weird manner. That's the outside position. That's, uh, how can you say, the etiquette of the day. That's not what he wants. The only way of being true to reality is being true to oneself. There's no other way. And once you understand that, this very dense language that Alexander has starts to make sense. It's a little bit like a time travel. I go to the time of Frederick Matthias Alexander, somewhere in the beginning of the last, last century. And I understand that he was helping himself. Obviously, he had problems. He couldn't recite Shakespeare and he was losing both his livelihood and his honor. He did fix that though, there's no doubt about that. And he didn't do it by cohere to the standards of the day. He didn't end up in a military position. He did actually try that and it didn't work. It made things worse. So the intention must come from within. And I think what's happening when we are slowing down our uh, movement, there is a change in our postural attitudes. It's another difficult word from Alexander, but a posture attitude, it's my response to the environment, other people. It's what I think I should do to satisfy other people. Remember the military position. You do that not for your own sake, but to look good perceivably to other people. Cheers. And that is actually the start of the problem. It's like we develop a self that is a reflection of what we think others need from us. And that idea starts in ourselves. And somehow, when we're slowing down the process, the bodily system notices that and it corrects itself automatically. We don't have to use will. We're not even supposed to do willy. There's no volition. This is volition. But here is a healing process. And all of a sudden, Ken Ware and Alexander are on the exact same level. They mean the same thing. And now it also becomes clearer for me uh, what Alexander meant about thinking procedure. It's a thinking that doesn't adopt to a format. A format could actually be, in a way, the thing we mentioned in lecture 742. Uh, the system of the enlightenment, something that worked fantastic and you could do magic, but think about it carefully. It's not coming from inside. It's something you do, that's correct, you do it, but it's outside of yourself. Could it be, this is just a question, could it be a confusion of interior and exterior. That the thing coming from the outside, it's perfectly good, it's nothing wrong, it's impossible to criticize anyway, but we ourselves make some sort of confusion and we confuse what we see on the outside, uh, 
calculation of the sort I mentioned, the wheel uh, or the, the wagon and the horse, we think that could be applied to ourselves. And what we do, we are enforcing something exterior to the interior and we make a category mistake. And if it is like so, I, I won't say if it is or not, we would gain a very, very big advantage. We can keep everything about the Enlightenment. We can keep technology, we can keep the advancement, and we can look at it as an individual, from a personal view, confusion of exterior processes with interior processes. And this actually goes hand in hand with slowing down the movement. Because what happens then is that when I move myself very, very slowly, the body realizes there is a confusion. I mistake exterior manners for the interior because it gets me back to the body. And then the system realizes that what's best for it. Automatic, unconscious, but working. And if that would be the case, it would be a fantastic gain. We don't have to uh, shy away from technology. We don't have to burn laptops or uh, 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 spinning jammy as they did in uh, the early 19th century or other implements of technology. We don't have to do as the Mennonites or the Amish flee out into the woods and not accepting any technology. We can slow down the process and the body will realize we are trying to implement something external, almost like like a, a very, very uh, uh, harsh teacher telling us, you have to do that, or maybe a father that's uh, super authoritarian and said, don't slouch, stretch. It's a little bit like that, but in a very, very small way, in a very minute way. But of course, the immensity of everything, of technology, we had for a long time now, two centuries, almost three, that has slowly influenced. Because this fits with my own explanation. It took a long time. It didn't happen all of a sudden. It happened more quickly with intellectuals like Voltaire. But I don't think Voltaire took it to his heart. He continued to be a happy fellow. It took some time, it took a century, I would think, at least, until it entered into the body-mind uh, uh, system and became something embodied that the body somehow believed in. And that, I would say, that I'm quite more certain because it has to be like the body believes in something. It's being tricked somewhere. It's not the mind alone. The body is being tricked. And could it be by slowing it down, it relearns? This is a little bit uh, that Ken Ware is pointing to. Uh, he speaks about a re-education of the body-mind system. And uh, it takes a while and he has a, a rather strict regiment in the beginning. I think the first time you are not supposed to have a pulse above 140, 150. Uh, and this is because any arousal with the pulse will trigger once more uh, the fast twitch muscle and neurons. So for some time you're not supposed to go over with a certain pulse or a certain exertion and um, and that makes sense if the system is supposed to relearn and the reason the system doesn't uh, is not able to really uh, um, re-educate itself 
is because it's moving too quickly to, to sort of read off itself. Uh, of course, when the period is finished, you can go back to have a pulse uh, as high as you want to. Then the system is in the new balance and uh, can wear next a parallel with what's happening if you have a fibrillation. A fibrillation is when the heart kicks over to a very uh, straight going up and down curve and you don't have a steady rhythm anymore. Oddly enough, it's too systematic. And what you do is that you stop the heart with an electric pulse and you are just hoping that it will return to a more normal strange attractor. That's what you do actually. It's, uh, it's, it's not, not more uh, scientific than that. So it's a hope and it always does, almost always, it does go back. This is similar. We don't stop the heart, but we slow down movements. And in this slowing down, you come to the point of heart stop. The heart doesn't really stop, but it vibrates. It's like this shaking. And from the shake, it goes to a proper pulse. And what could happen when you slow down the movement? It's starting to shake. Then is when you reach this level of the body not being decided for which strange attractor should I take? Should I go back to the old one or should I try this more balanced? And therefore the body is shaking. That's the explanation of Ken Ware. Makes sense. Uh, in a way, it does make sense. Uh, why should it be only the heart in the body that's working according to this principle? If you read a medical book, that medical book will tell you all organs uh, in the body and the body itself is regulated by some steering function in the brain, but the heart is not. The heart is regulated by something that's even more steady than the brain. It's regulated by something that's from nature itself. The heart will actually go into sane rhythm even if it's outside the body. That's quite amazing. It doesn't need neural impulses to go that way. And to add some argument to Ken Ware, it does make sense. Why wouldn't the whole body be like the heart if that's how the nature works? Because nature is the strongest factor. That's admitted by the doctors. Nothing is stronger than the heart's rhythm. You can't beat that by making a machine that gives impulses every second. It's unbeatable. It's the best. Actually a good pun there, unbeatable. <laughs> <laughs> so Kenware makes a lot of sense and uh, it actually helped uh, me to understand Alexander. But some of the problems with Frederick Mephi Alexander is his language. There's no doubt about that. It's a hundred years old and uh, some people even say it didn't make much sense even at those days because the subject matter is incredibly hard to explain and you always risk in falling into these traps and uh, actually it made me uh, well i shouldn't say i made me happy to see mcgilchrist fall into that trap i hugely admire the man don't get me wrong but uh, that made me feel that we're all humans Another connection I was thinking of, and that's the directions you do in your head. We can translate that to the verbal thing that we're going on in our minds now, the remembering of verses. Uh, I have 33 paragraphs from Edward de Bono, and for every movement I do in my head, I add a certain phrase, and in a way, this stops the brain's too fast activities, the thinking process of the head or the mind, maybe I should say, doesn't rush away. So at the same time, I'm slowing down my body 
I'm also slowing down my head with these things. And here I'm pretty much more sure. Uh, I don't know if you remember the example uh, what happened to some convents, a lot of convents I would think, in 1961 or 2, uh, somewhere there, uh, when they changed uh, the ritual within the Catholic Church, one of those blasted popes we can't trust, they took away the Latin uh, hymns and psalms and recitation and when they did that and you have to remember these monks were people who only slept max six hours per night even less they went into disaster already after two three months people were getting sick by the number they could not hack the very strict ritual at the monasteries when they didn't do this uh, reciting in Latin by heart and this is something McGilchrist mentioned that was a huge disaster in the end uh, and I think it was especially some convents in northern France uh, they made an exception they had to it was either making an exception or disband of the whole uh, monastery because it didn't work and I think that recital that learning by heart is incredibly important to slow down the thinking process. And when you watch movies from the time, you can actually go into YouTube and see precisions from the 50s or the 40s or the 30s, when they still did the Latin liturgy. You can see that those monks and nuns, they are not misusing themselves. They are excruciatingly calm, even when they are being interviewed. You can see that they clearly uh, have the manner of inhibit responses. Uh, when they get asked in interview, there is a little pause, not very long, but you can see the monk or the nun, or usually it's abbots that gets questions, and they respond in a very calm way. And you notice also they've been thinking through what they say before they say anything. So actually the directions of Frederick Mathias Alexander seem as, actually this is coming from Ian McGilchrist, they seem to slow down the exaggerated postural attitudes we have mentally in the mind and also in the body. Actually, some of those interviews are, I watched them last night, they are beautiful to see. You see a person who actually embodies believing belief and doing religious practice. It's very obvious. And then, I, of, of course, I have to pop to the uh, 2020 editions of interviews of uh, abbots and uh, abbotesses, whatever you call it, abbotesses. Mother. Mothers. Mothers. Holy mothers. Mothers. And then you can see some of them, not all of them, but some of them are actually a bit stressed. It's rather obvious. And they even interrupt the interviews. And I challenge you to find a single interview before 1950 where uh, the abbot or mother are interrupting uh, the interviewer. It doesn't happen. It's a very big change in demeanor. And you have to think, exaggerate that even a bit more. And then you are at the time of Frederick Matthias Alexander, the 1870s, the 1880s. He's living in the countryside, very far from civilization. You can't really get farther from the Western world as he was in Tasmania. That's the uh, longest distance he took. Uh, I think it took like three weeks with boat to get there from Europe. And of course, he was able to uh, sort of develop himself like an individual. And he remained an individual until the day he died. He did not listen to other people if they didn't make sense. He didn't conform to anything. He was a true self-made man. And 
watch the old uh, adults and you, you see that that's a person that has integrity. That's a calm person, really listening to the questions as well. They're very good listeners, but the responses are just beautiful. And you can hear on the voices, they really bear. And it's not literally caused by reciting how many hours, three, four hours a day. It's caused by the concentration it gives. It takes down the hastily demeanor. And as Ian McGilchrist points to, that's the way of being spiritual. Because once you calm down uh, these postural attitudes, as Alexander would say, or can what I would call that disharmonious strange attractors is a bit of a mouthful. Uh, you, you could just call those atheists. Like a very, very tough left brain is atheist. We know that. You can actually have a stroke in the right hemisphere. And if you were religious before, that's going to be gone. Because you don't have the body anymore. You don't have reality anymore. And isn't that interesting? <laughs> so it's starting to make sense, the rituals of the convent, why they did that and how they made even the monks and the nuns more healthy. Because there is a big change in the health of the monks and nuns after like 1970-75. They starting to get the same stress syndrome as the rest of the population heart diseases, cancer, and also nervous diseases like neurosis and you know, like bad stomach. It's quite challenging to be in a convent. Uh, I tried sometimes myself and not being able to sleep is one of the most taxing things. And another thing is you can't get any outlet for social contact. It's uh, not much talk going on. And I see now how this reciting, if you know it by heart especially, how that helps to calm yourself down. And then you can also reach this bare awareness where you really see reality. And uh, I'm not going to go into that subject now because it's just 1.30. It's way too early for any spiritual discussions. But wouldn't it be uh, wondrous if bare awareness actually opens up for a spiritual reality that we in our regular stressed out mind can perceive? In a world of sameness, everything is explained, everything is determined, hey, there's not much room for God or even a free will. And free will, well, I'm allowed to take up since it's only 1.30. We know free will is gone in modern times, something that Benjamin Libet proved and has actually been confirmed many, many times after that. It could actually be that bare awareness brings will back, our intention. Because when we slow down this loop of postural attitudes, we become whole again. And we start to have a choice. Another very important term from Alexander, to have a choice. What he means with the choice is an actual choice, where you don't follow your regular thinking patterns. Me drinking coffee now, is not the choice. I do it by habit. But a choice could be something completely different. For instance, a creative thought coming up with something new. Then you are much closer to a choice. And it's almost like we in modern days are living in a prison. Isn't it odd? We are allowed to do whatever we want today. We are not uh, having to kneel in front of a landlord like even my grandparents' parents. They have to kneel for a grand, uh, landlord, patron as it's called in Swedish. 
uh, or a feudal lord, a count, that said you have to do this and that. And many people, especially here in Sweden, we had a, a very huge powerhouse with the Swedish church because that they decided everything in human beings' life. If they even were allowed to move to the next municipality, and they were actually the people who were giving out passports. And without a passport, you couldn't travel, not even inland. So I think still in those days, they saw that as exterior regulations, exterior, well, you could call it attitudes of reality, but interiorly, they still had a choice because they were not affected by these ideas. Uh, they were free to think whatever they did. And we know that people in the olden days, they didn't have this posture misuse. Look at all photos from the 19th century. You will find very, very few people being slouched. slouched. It's very uncommon. Uh, so they had still a free choice. And Alexander says, and this is what he means in this uh, dramatic uh, start of the book, Constructive Conscious Control, without a free will, you won't even be a human being. And this is the free will that make human beings great. And uh, listen to the title of his other book, a bit more old, Man's Supreme Inheritance. The supreme inheritance is to have a free will, to choose. And to choose means to think whatever you want. Doesn't always mean to do whatever you want. We are confusing interior and exterior once more. I think somewhere in history, quite recent history, we changed exterior liberty changed to exterior liberty and gave up interior liberty. And interior liberty is the choice to be balanced, to do the movements we want to do with our bodies, not movements that are harmful to ourselves. What sort of liberty is that if most people today, by habit, harm themselves? How does the mind feel about that? And how do you feel yourself when you are hurting yourself every day? And you're getting away with the energy you can get from being directed and being harmonious. That's a self-inflicted pain. And it almost looks like this most common thing today uh, the young people does. They cut themselves. I would say misuse is the start of cutting yourself hurting yourself, and not loving yourself. And what sort of love for other people can we do if we don't even love ourselves? If we are hurting ourselves, how can we give anything to anybody else? I think that's a riddle we need to be so, that, that needs to be solved. And uh, going back to bear awareness can actually heal us in a way that's also morally. Because I would say it's very hard to be moral if you don't have a liking even to yourself. There is an expression in uh, uh, Sanskrit it's called niyama yama. And yama means helping others, being polite, showing sympathy, compassion, but niyama is to yourself. That's where the santosha is. This is where you treat yourself in a way prince would deserve, and that's how you should treat yourself. You shouldn't treat yourself any worse than a prince or a king or an emperor, because the body is a temple, and disgracing that temple is like taking out ev everything good in the world. So I think it's uh, rather thrilling to reread some of uh, Alexander's stuff. 
And uh, the good thing is most of the books I read uh, many years ago and many times. So I can sort of revise them into my head and it's very practical. But once I read them, uh, at the time I read them, was loads of things I did not understand. Uh, and inhibiting, it's not a good term, to, it's, it's not an easy term to understand. Uh, a better way is uh, the proposal I found on the internet here. Uh, a too quick and unthinking reaction. Slow the whole process down, your thinking will become progressively better. And I noticed that the last couple of days here, the weeks, so many times, just laying down in the constructive rest the other day, uh, all of a sudden how the oven is working came to my mind almost directly. And it came from the body, so to speak. So it's a bit that we are returning to the body's own intelligence. And that's an intelligence that is slower in a way, but actually reacts much quicker. Because the usual ruts, they do take a long time. It's also a thing that uh, Benjamin Libet showed. It takes well, not very much longer, but you speak about 10, 20 milliseconds, something of that vicinity. But that time is a complete killer if you're a football player. That's more than enough to lose. And you are bound to lose every game until you learn how to inhibit. Because your reactions are bound to be out of place. They are actually predetermined. And the whole thing you are doing, you are... Uh, and acting, a pre-rehearsed play that you didn't, didn't even write the script to. You're just following lead. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a good point here, uh, Alexander. Uh, this is really man's supreme inheritance. And this is what will make, I think, man great again. We will revive our uh, old force and become both mentally and spiritually strong and course bodily conscious. I think that's a good point to turn here. I say uh, have a very pleasant afternoon and thank you very much. Thank you, thank you.